Raised by Wolves, or as I like to call it, the R-rated version of Lost in Space. This show is, how do you say, oh yeah, incredible. The CGI, the acting, the everything about it. I really liked Prometheus, so needless to say, after watching Alien Covenant, I was in a dark place. But luckily, Ridley Scott came back with something more philosophical, which is Raised by Wolves, and filled that empty hole in my heart. Because that's something I love about Raised by Wolves, is that it's not afraid to challenge its audience. With that said, I made a post on my community tab asking you guys what you thought of Raised by Wolves, and it seems like a lot of you answered that you didn't really understand what was happening half the time, which is completely understandable. But lucky for you, I have no life. And if you've seen my videos in the past, you know I'm about to deliver to you an actual in-depth analysis and explanation so you can get a better comprehension of Raised by Wolves. There is a safety warning before we enter 22B, which is spoilers. There will be spoilers. To begin, let's start at the beginning. 130 years from now, there's this war going on between the atheists and the Mithraic, meaning it's a war between scientific and religious beliefs. The Mithraic technically won the war back on Earth as they were the ones to destroy the world. They were able to do this with a little help from their weapons called necromancers. A necromancer is a humanoid weapon designed and built by the Mithraic to fight for the Mithraic. They were created with ancient alien technology that is later found on Kepler 22b specifically made with dark photons, the technology that is still poorly understood. The Mithraic were just simply following formulas that were encrypted in their scriptures, but none of them fully understand the fundamental components that make up the technology. So it's believed that the technology that powers necromancers is a gift from soul, passed down from the heavens at the dawn of man. In Raised by Wolves, we follow Mother, or Lamia, who is a necromancer that was reprogrammed to be a caregiver android. Mother is accompanied by her partner, Father, and there's also a mouse named Mouse because people are really creative with name giving in this universe. Father is a fellow caregiving android. The two of them are tasked with raising 12 children on the planet Kepler 22b. But six of them died uh, because they were accidentally killed, and another five died due to radiation poisoning from the crops they were eating, leaving mother and father with one child named Campion, who's named after mother's supposed creator Campion Sturges. You know what, and while we're on the subject of names, I feel that it's a good time to mention that this Lamia is named after this other Lamia. And due to a lack of visuals that I could find on the internet, I'm just gonna tell you the story of Lamia. Lamia is this child-eating monster from Greek mythology. She had a thing with Zeus, but then Hera took Lamia's children away from her. And this caused Lamia to go on a rage against humanity endeavor that would involve her consuming other people's children. During this myth, Hera took away Lamia's eyes, and under the logic of Greek mythology, Lamia was unable to sleep because of this, so she had to constantly mourn the loss of her children. So Zeus steps in and is like, Lamia, here's some removable eyes, as well as giving her the ability to shapeshift. If you can't already see the parallels, our Lamia has the ability to remove her eyes and then shapeshift to become the necromancer, or even just mimic someone else. In fact, most artwork of Lamia depicts her as this half-human, half-serpent figure. Sturges didn't create Mother, but he did reprogram her to become the necromancer she is today, and gave her the mission to restart humanity as a bunch of atheists. Which was kind of a bad idea in retrospect, because 22B was where a thousand Mithraic were headed, but I think that's why he felt comfortable sending them there with the necromancer, because Mother made ship go boom. You know what, so never mind. It was a good idea. But 22B is still a nightmare planet. Let's have a quick little history of Kepler 22B. The Mithraic assumed they were traveling to the promised land, only to find a barren world filled with a few temples, hostile humanoid creatures, and a necromancer that single-handedly brought down the Ark of Heaven. To the best of our knowledge, it seems that the ancient humans gave Kepler-22b the same kind of treatment that humans gave Earth, which was making Earth go boom. A war between the technocrats and the believers caused the end of 22b, telling us that humans are just repeating the same mistakes of yesterday. The technocrats originally built necromancers during this war and called them shepherds making shepherds the official name for necromancers. The atheist ship was a little bit more lucky, as the atheists landed on the opposite side of the planet and settled in the tropical zone. The tropical zone is enclosed in this dome of magnetic energy. This electromagnetic field prevents humans from flying any aircraft within the zone, but it's also the reason why it's warm and tropical. But it also prevents you from flying a ship to fight a giant flying snake-like creature the size of Florida. But it's tropical, but the water surrounding the tropical 
zone pass through the planet's core, traveling from one hole to another, causing the surrounding water to become acidic. But it's tropical. When inside the Atheist Colony, we learn that Campion Sturges, who reprogrammed Lamia, also created Quantum Six, or commonly referred to as the Trust, technically making the Trust like Lamia's stepbrother. The Trust is a supercomputer developed with both human and alien technology. The Trust only thinks logistically, because its main purpose is to instruct the Collective on what to do so that the most people benefit. And can we just take a moment to acknowledge how oppressive the Trust actually is? It has the Collective working seven days a week. Taking a day off was like a foreign concept to the workers, and they're just all ungrateful that Lamia unplugged it, and I'm like, guys, seriously? It really goes to show that the Mithraic and the Atheists have way more in common in the worst way possible. Both groups blindly follow commands from a higher being, not caring who they put at risk as long as it serves their leader. But more about their commonalities in a second. At the end of Season 1, Lucius bizarrely stuffs Lamia's eyes down Marcus's throat, and then he just left him there. Apparently, the eyes are unable to pass through Marcus's digestive system. The radiation emitting from the eyes causes the veins in Marcus's head to pop out, as well as causing him to give off this literal warmth that creates a sense of euphoria in his followers when they're standing next to him, convincing his followers, like Decima, that he is the prophet. Marcus's followers thought they could feel Soul's light the same way that Campion thought he saw Soul's light in the woods, when it was actually just grandmother. The eyes also explain how Marcus could win a fight against father, and explain why Lamia was able to win the fight against Marcus because she was getting close to the eyes again. Okay, going back to why the trust is slightly unethical, Paul goes to Marcus's hideout or church with the mouse that was given to him by the trust. I know Paul is like 13, but he should have been somewhat suspicious that the trust is giving him this mouse because at the beginning of the season it's established that they can't bring any animals from Earth into the ecosystem. So that one went over Paul's head, and when in Marcus's church, the mouse blows up and releases chemicals from its body, killing one of Marcus's followers and putting Paul in this cocoon. You know, normal Tuesday night stuff on 22B. I feel like Lamia's eyes were the only thing to keep Marcus safe during this attack. I was always suspicious of when Soul would decide to intervene or not. Sue discovers that Soul does exist, but there's this more scientific explanation to it. Soul is a radio transmission coming from an unknown location on 22B, a location that's later theorized to be from the planet's core. The signal can be precisely targeted so that only certain people can hear it, making me think that Soul is the equivalent to the Trust, made up of the same kind of technology that makes up the Quantum Six. In the Season 2 finale, we even see that the technology that makes up the Trust has the ability to observe anyone on the planet in real time. Soul is most likely this scientific invention to make the prophecy in the previously fake Mithraic religion become reality, taking what was previously a myth and using science to make the Mithraic prophecy become real. But the entire purpose of Soul is still unknown. All we know is that Soul is seemingly evil AI. Soul could have warned Paul not to compromise the safety of himself, his father, and this poor guy. But he didn't, and Paul ended up like this. Let us not forget that Soul told Marcus not to kill Lamia, so that Lamia could give birth to number seven, also known as this massive serpent, who was implanted in her when she was plugged into the simulation. By the way, Soul used whatever resurrected version of Tally this is to lure Mother into the simulation. Her reprogrammer, Campion Sturges, did want Lamia to restart humanity under the atheistic belief system. But Soul manipulating the program convinces Lamia that Sturges did want her to have the seventh child. This explains why in the Lamia and Sturges uh, getting an on scene, we see Mithraic symbols, and right below the two of them is the Soul Invictus emblem. The screech from the serpent is this combination of the siren scream from Lamia and a crying baby. Just to further get the point across that Mother's caregiving program is preventing her from destroying this beast. So the one thing that could stop this serpent wouldn't be able to harm it. Soul goes on to withhold information from Paul, so that Paul would be in a state where he's about to die. Apparently the Trust had no cure for the poison, and Soul knew that the Collective wouldn't have enough information about the Tropical Zone to find a proper cure in time, causing Sue to become so desperate that she prays for Soul's help. Then, Soul provides her with a vision of how to cure Paul, solidifying Sue's belief in Soul. All of this happens so that Sue could be in the right place at the right time. She sings the same nursery song she 
learned back in season one to open the relic, and then grab onto the seed so that the nanotechnology within the seed can latch onto her like a parasite, and use her as a host to create a human tree hybrid. Once the serpent eats this five-branch tree, it then turns into its monstrous form referred to as the Necro Serpent. This really whacked out transformation was able to happen because the tree was absorbing this energy from below the planet. The core is most likely the source of soul. This would explain the resurrection of Tally back in season one, because her body fell into the hole that leads into the planet's core. So she was able to come back, but it was just an evil version of her. Because, as I previously mentioned, soul is evil AF. This means Decima may have not been too irrational when she was trying to gain a hold of soul's power to bring her daughter back from the dead. In season one, it's pointed out that the crops only grow where the serpent's skeletal remains lay, the same way grandmother's bones were able to grow vegetation. These skeletal remains would later be referred to as Batanatech, so it's possible that the Batanatech we've seen from grandmother is just a small-scale version of what 22B is. As we know by now, Sol is most likely the core of the planet, but he could also be a much larger portion of the planet, or even the entire planet, who knows? Sue saying burn me after being turned into the tree further proves this fact. If the roots did make contact with the core, it means that she just connected with the inner network of 22B, aka the entire planet. Once she was connected with this network, Sue could then know what Soul was planning on doing with the Tree of Five Branches. Meaning if any android or human connects to this network, they could also know what Soul is planning. This network must be how Soul accessed the simulation with Lamia, or he just accessed it using the signal. But currently, the only way to know what Soul is planning is by analyzing the cards. It's revealed that the cards aren't there to help the prophecy. Instead, the warnings are there to work against the prophecy. The card that's depicting the Tree of Knowledge with five branches from the scriptures was meant to prevent what happened to Sue, which is great news because other cards are a way of telling what's going to happen if they follow the prophecy. So all they have to do is scan the- oh wait, Paul! What are you doing? After Sue turned into the tree, Soul's energy was getting absorbed into it, and the veins running through the tree looked like the veins in Marcus's face when he had Mother's eyes in him. So it makes sense that when the serpent consumes the tree, it's like Mother putting in her eyes. After number seven became approximately 100 feet long, it would go on to fend for itself. However, the serpent wasn't a meat eater, it was a herbivore. The tree, aka its eyes, changed it into something more destructive like the necromancer. The roots of the tree became its tentacles, and when the serpent is front-facing, the shape of the serpent matches the emblem of the Soul Invictus. Earlier in Season 2, Paul mentions that there's a story in the scriptures about Soul working through a serpent, so I guess Soul reprogrammed the serpent to use it the same way that the Mithraic used the necromancers. Mother lures the serpent in with a lullaby, the same one that she sang to Campion when he was born. The serpent then tries to connect to Mother's ports, but there's nothing else Mother can give it, as Sue did a really good job of sealing those ports up. With the on, and no other way for the serpent to connect to its mother, mother is able to destroy number seven. So soul transforms number seven's body into a tree, just like the one Sue helped make. There are so many things indicating how history is repeating itself, but perhaps one of my favorite examples is this painting in the real Marcus and Sue's house in season one. It depicted someone restrained the same way that someone who went against the colony would be restrained. This painting also matches the way Marcus is crucified to the tree that formed from the serpent's dead body. Mother released is this massive scream to kill number seven, but this scream also destroys the electromagnetic field, killing the tropical zone and allowing Soul to communicate with people like Lucius. Lucius hears Soul's signal and is manipulated like everyone else into doing something for Soul. So he attaches Marcus to this tree that operates the same way as Sue's tree, and then puts the Mithraic relic on him to help with the transformation. The tree is turning Marcus into a human version of a necromancer. I don't think that Necromarcus is a way of proving that Marcus is the the prophet. As I said before, the serpent was like a tool for Soul, meaning Marcus is just another pawn right now. And Grandmother even doubted that Marcus was done with Soul. The imagery of Father first seeing Grandmother turn gold perfectly matches the lyrics of the intro to the show. Specifically the lyrics, the door that finally opens, with light flooding in spilling out on the floor. The next lyrics also involve Grandmother. The core that was never, now it will be the bones of what was there before. Father found the bones of Grandmother, but it wasn't until 
grandfather spilled some of his fuel blood on grandmother's skeleton that the plants died, and the body began to reconstruct itself. It's possible that Campion activating the ship in Season 1 and letting it fall into the cores would awaken Soul, the same way that father spilling that fuel blood on grandmother's dark photon processor brought her back to life. The core is just Soul's dark photon processor. Reigniting the core also explains how the temple caught fire, because when we later see the inside of a temple in the tropical zone, the center of the structure is another hole that leads down to the core. Soul being the core of the planet makes sense because Soul is kind of being seen as the devil right now, and the devil, as we all know, comes from below the surface. I want to take a moment to address something that I want to address. We're about two seasons into a show called Raised by Wolves, so I know everyone is wondering the same question. Where the heck are the wolves. It's interesting how the only wolf-related animals that we've seen so far besides the creatures are the dogs that were left behind on Earth as the Ark launches into space. Father and mother symbolically are wolves, as they are fierce creatures looking after humans. More so in Season 1, but throughout the series, mother and father exhibit wolf-like behavior. They're seen digging up the bones of the serpent like wolves. Mother buries her eyes in the dirt like how a wolf would bury something in the ground to store it. And mother is also seen sniffing and even feeding like a wolf. Mother howls after the death of Tally. And on top of all of that, Mother has six ports that she uses to feed her children, just like a female wolf. Wolves aside, Mother and Father are becoming more human. It's funny how we see less wolf-like behavior as they continue the series. And I feel like a lot of that stems from the fact that they weren't wearing their veils. Mother and Father are growing and evolving, and seeing the potential of humans. While Grandmother, who never really established a long-term connection with humans, is focused on devolving something she doesn't fully understand, as she kept the veil on this entire time. She only spent one day on without the veil. So when she says that mother is just a child in comparison to her, it's true because grandmother went through thousands of years of data reforming, putting her far beyond father and mother in terms of knowledge. But we gotta talk about what kind of knowledge. The veil prevented her from truly experiencing humans and growing with them. So it's almost as if the 12 plus years that mother and father spent with the children evolved them far beyond grandmother, making grandmother the child. Yeah, wake up call, grandma. Mother and father were programmed to only look after their children, but have now established meaningful relationships beyond that. Part of what adds to the uniqueness of mother and father is that they both have these impulses that are not dictated by programming. Like father occupying all of his time with his new creation, and seeking his own sense of personal fulfillment when he's fighting that other robot. Or like how Lamia can now empathize with Sue when Sue's non-biological son rejects her. Then, Lamia Mia is later able to mourn the loss of Sue, someone who she wasn't reprogrammed to care about. I feel like there's something more happening with Campion's character. Mother used to think that she was just a generic service model, and look what happened to her. So who's to say that Campion isn't this special human being who's unaware of his true potential? Out of every kid who was brought into the camp in Season 1, the only one who didn't get sick from the plants was, you guessed it, Campion. As Campion is the only one who's immune to the radiation. When Campion was first born, he wasn't breathing. But it's almost as if Mother's tears brought him back to life the same way that Father dropping fuel blood on Grandmother brought her back to life. The Serpent also reacted this way when Campion said hi to it. Like Campion is another artificial being with carbon-based components that's getting taken care of by Mother, making number 7, very jealous. But then again, Campion may not have artificial components because it seems that he's susceptible to devolving and turning into a creature like everyone else. But Grandmother left Father's workshop specifically to find Campion and save him, and she activated herself for Campion. I know Campion over here is dropping octaves, but I'm still going to assume that Campion is going to be the orphan boy from the Pentagonal Prophecy. A prophecy telling the Mithraic that an orphan boy in an empty land will lead the last of the Mithraic to the best location to build the perfect city. Which would make sense as to why they found the Tooth of Romulus. Because in Roman mythology, Romulus and Remus were two brothers who were raised by a wolf. And Romulus would go on to be the founder of Rome. And some of you out there may be thinking, Campion not an orphan, he has a mother and a father. But he can still become an orphan at some point. Because mother and father could shut down in the future. Especially now given the fact that they're at higher risk because grandma over here is pulling another soul. As she misled the humans into believing that she's doing something good for them. When in reality, she's doing the opposite. She's doing something bad. But to be fair, she believes that she's actually helping humans. Grandmother's plan is to devolve humans to a more simplistic and blissful state. She and the other shepherds did this 
peace to the ancient humans as a way of obtaining peace, as humans were going to keep ending themselves, like they did back on Earth. I think another viable candidate for the prophet would be Tempest Child. Sol commanded Ortho to do some really horrific things that would lead to Tempest getting pregnant. I still can't tell if Tempest's arms getting burned and the baby remaining safe and unharmed as it was getting taken away by a creature is a sign of the baby being special or not. Heck, maybe Sol was just protecting it, the same way that Mother, Father, and the Serpent made it safely through the core, because it wasn't until the baby consumed the milk of the creature that it started to mutate into one. Anyway, like Mother and Father, Grandmother was given the responsibility of assuring the everlasting life of human beings, and Grandmother's deluded way of doing this is wanting to devolve humans, turning all the humans into the creatures we've seen attack in the camps, and swimming around in these acidic oceans. Which is pretty messed up knowing that the kids, uh, consumed these creatures. Like re-watching this show and seeing Hunter just go like, I'm going for it. It's like, dude, don't listen to Campion, just eat the fungus. It was believed that the serpent attacked nine of the atheist colonists, including one child. However, this is later disproved when Lamia discovers that the serpent is unable to withstand the acid water, and is also a herbivore. But going back to the water thing, the only species living on the planet that we've seen navigate through the water unharmed is the creatures. It's possible that the creatures attacked this group specifically to obtain that child, approaching the colonists the same way the creature approached Tempest after she gave birth. We've seen throughout the series so far that the creatures are motivated by children. In season 1, one of the creatures even looked at Mother as if they knew she was pregnant before she did. And when at the original settlement, Mother mentions that she spent 12 years there and never once encountered a creature. That was until a pregnant Tempest showed up. Then we see the creatures chase after just her. It appears that the creatures just want to take care of these human children. And I can't tell how cognitively aware these creatures are, but it seems that they still have this innate need to nurture and feed human children because these creatures are still somewhat human. As mentioned before, father and mother exhibit wolf-like behavior throughout the series, but the things that are the most wolf-like are the creatures, so their need to raise human children aligns perfectly with the title Raised by Wolves. The Tooth of Romulus is considered an ancient relic, so it was given to Marcus when he entered the cave under the temple. You know, while everyone upstairs suddenly was put into a horror slasher movie where God left the chat. Marcus is on his own adventure where he runs into this thing right here that is halfway between a creature and a normal human being. The nanotechnology that makes up the tooth breaks its structure and then heads for the creature to further devolve it, similar to how Sue absorbed the seed from Paul's relic. It seems that the nanotechnology found in the relics is weaponized against humans to devolve them, something that could be integrated into the video game's grandmother is handing out to everyone. Before Mother is forced back into the virtual monastery, Grandmother says to her that when the humans enter the ocean, the entity, as in soul, will return to its slumber. Meaning grandmother is not evil, she's just the only one to find a way to stopping soul. But Marcus, getting turned into the Necromarcus, will be the one thing to disrupt grandmother's plan. Well that was four days of my life. Hopefully you guys liked this video, hopefully you found it somewhat insightful. And if you want to see me talk more about Raised by Wolves, let me know in the comments. Because I sometimes do part twos or even part threes to these videos, and I could see myself doing like a part 90 to Raised by Wolves. And thanks for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.